focus on urban national parks. Um, but I'm really interested to uh, hear about the work that's being done in Vermont. Um, and we have a great lineup of presenters today. First, we have Jarlath O'Neill Dunn. And he is the director of UVM's uh, Spatial Analysis Laboratory and holds a joint position as a faculty member in the Rubenstein School and with the USDA Forest Service. Over the years, his research has focused on application of geospatial technology to a broad set of issues ranging from forest health to urban planning to disaster response to environmental justice. <coughs> and in his talk, he will be mapping Vermont from above, turning data into information. Thanks for this. Well, that's the title I had to give my presentation in order to get it by these really boring people at the steering committee. But my talk is really entitled, How Dr. Eagle and Drones Will Help Us Monitor Vermont's Landscape. Um, is it possible to digital lights? Yes. I've just got a lot of fancy images. Time. So anyway, let's start with the first guy here, Dr. Abel, and how he's going to help us map our landscape. Um, a real visionary in uh, terms of mapping, and a lot of people don't know this, it's sort of one of those things that's been swept under the carpets because he was not popular, largely due to the discrimination against his name, Dr. Evil. But um, his vision was this, you know, when I ask for sharks with freaking laser beams on their heads, I expect sharks with laser beams on their heads. I mean, it was really a visionary statement. And although his design never came to fruition, it turned out that even though we can't put lasers on shark's head, we can put them on airplanes. <coughs> we put them on airplanes and use them to map our landscape. Really great things happen. So one of the exciting things in Vermont is in the coming years, we're having increasing amounts of data that's known as LIDAR, light detection and ranging. And this comes from the near infrared laser. Um, in the past, this has really been sort of the purview of research projects or wealthy areas. This is New York City. You might recognize Central Park here in Columbus Circle. Really great LIDAR data that was acquired in 2010, and we've looked at that. But now we're getting similar data sets for Vermont. Okay, this is some stuff that just became available um, for the Waterbury um, area. And we expect the whole uh, Champlain uh, basin on the Vermont side and most of the New York side, I think, to be covered by by 2015. So really remarkable data. We're looking at three-dimensional information at a resolution of uh, several points per square meter. So ability to map the landscape more detailed than ever before. And in the spatial analysis lab, what we've been doing is we've been taking data such as our existing imagery, taking that LIDAR data, and then turning this data into information in the form of high-resolution land cover mapping products. So we've got some funding right now, and over the next coming years, as these LiDAR and imagery products become available, we expect to build out high resolution, so one meter land cover for the entire Lake Champlain Basin, or at least any areas where we can get LiDAR available um, using this uh, type of model. So you can imagine right now, where most of the times we're focused on these 30 meter data sets, with this, you'll be able to quantify, for example, stream buffers, forested stream buffers for every single stream segment in the entire Lake Champlain Basin. So really sort of revolutionary in terms of the amount of detail that we get, especially important in Vermont's fragmented landscape. We can also take this and do other detailed information. Here's examples of where we're cutting that LIDAR down and sort of estimating where the individual trees are, and then computing things such as the average canopy height and the maximum canopy height based on the LIDAR. Once again, things that we just don't have. We've got canopy estimates right now, but there's sort of these 30 meter course resolution things. Now we're getting down to the point where we can sort of map these individual trees. And then for a given area, you can look at plotting things out, like your histograms of maximum uh, tree canopy height and seeing how your distribution is for an area. And like I said, imagine being able to sort of cookie cut any place out in Vermont and be able to do that. And that's what we'll have in the coming years. And then we can also do some sort of interesting configurations. Right now we're sort of really limited with the course resolution data to look at things like forest patch configuration with the high resolution data. This completely changes as it changes and all new opportunities open up. And so we can gain an understanding about how fragmented our forest and landscape is. So let's move to our next topic to get within the, the time limit here. And I've got a leave early today to get my kids to ski practice, take advantage of the good snow. So uh, we talked about drones as well, and drones kind of have a bad reputation because people think of them as either blowing things up, uh, sort of what you see here, or spying on folks with video cameras, but we have one in the spatial analysis lab. Um, doors open, so we'll keep 
quiet here, but what we uh, codename Operation Drunken Raven. Okay, this is our little drone here. It fits in this uh, briefcase. This is my uh, best attempt to impersonate a, a, a VTrans employee. We were out flying one of their sites. The key thing I found out when you go to VTrans sites, even if you got all the gear, if your vest looks brand new, you stand out like a sore thumb. So I take this now, like I roll it around in the mud before I go out because otherwise they're just like, who are you, some sort of inspector or something. But this type of technology is really, really interesting because right now we're always constrained whether it's LiDAR or imagery. Those data sets are done when it's optimal flying conditions, right? We don't have control when we want to acquire data. The drone technology will allow us to gather imagery over small areas when we want to and when we need to. And so you can imagine being able to image perhaps a forested stand over a growing season or getting before and after images of a stream during flooding uh, times of floods. This is all becomes possible. So I'll show you some data. This is um, two scenes from Lake Champlain. Okay, this is uh, spring, high level. And this is fall, okay, low Lake Champlain level. Okay, these flights took us about uh, 35 minutes apiece. This is down near Shelburne Bay. Okay, so your ability to go out there rapidly map these, produce mapping grade images, and do it within um, you know, 30 minutes each flight and about eight hours to turn around the product is something that's really new and exciting. We've been down to, oops, sorry, we've been down to Reedsboro and Wardsboro. This is an area where there's uh, extreme flooding during Irene. Okay, this is some imagery of that same area taken from the drone. There you can see that severe erosion. And here we have a 3D model generated from the drone. Okay, so because it's gathering this high resolution data, we can actually generate these very detailed 3D models and do things like compute one for contours for this area. Uh, here's some other imagery, very, very recent. Uh, this is the Great Brook here in Plainfield, and we went out and we flew this just on Monday. Obviously, the conditions for lighting aren't ideal. You'd never, ever actually fly uh, traditional imagery during this time of year because you get the extreme shadowing. But with the drone, we don't care about that. We can go and map things wherever. So it's really neat. We can go out and map these streams in the wintertime, do images where we've never, ever, ever had data before, and now take that out and, and sort of make them available. And this is really, really detailed stuff here when you're talking to the four centimeter uh, resolution. So it's fantastic data, and I think, oh yeah, here we have one more. This is another 3D model. Uh, these are some trees down in Shelburne Bay, once again, uh, taken from the drone imagery and looking about a, a, uh, an eight-hour turnaround to get something like this. So very, very detailed structural information that we can get about our forest from small, lightweight, and uh, you know, as long as you don't believe all the media reports on intrusive technology. So Bess, I've wrapped my stuff up. I'm in under 10 minutes, and do we have any questions? Yeah, so we have Questions? Yes. All the images you've shared have been more um, developed or agricultural landscapes. Have you tried using that same technology in a, in a forested setting? Yeah, we have. So, I mean, here you've got some. This is a little bit of a forest that you see here, right? And actually, this is this area here is mostly these are just all the deciduous trees. So, right. Uh, that would be closed canopy in the summertime here. Here you can actually clearly see the conifers. Um, and you know, we probably, you know, we haven't tried it yet, but I'm wondering if, if someone's good, they might be able to even do some species recognition from, uh, from the data. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got, this, you've got these traditional, right, star, star shaped and things like that, so I think you'll be able to pull out some species data. So this is some of the stuff. Over this summer, I think we're going to try to figure out some forested stand to fly. It's very important to keep in mind that you're not going to be doing tens of thousands of acres with a system like this, right? You're not going to fly the Green Mountain National Forest. But you've got a plot of land you're interested in, and you can go out and fly this. You've got small landowners, which we often have in Vermont, that have today, you know, really haven't used data like this. Something like this becomes affordable to them. Yeah. Have you thought about? Um, I mean, this is just kind of <coughs> peripheral thought, but pertaining to um, identifying species, you could fly that, and when the oaks had leaves and nothing else did, yeah. you could fly it when all the red maples were. You know, you could basically get almost. A yeah, absolutely. And understory as well. You're looking for invasives that might leaf out earlier. Yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's absolutely great. And stuff that you couldn't do right now. I mean, you can do it with fixed wing aircraft, but it's going to cost you yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars. And as long as you're okay with mapping a small area, this technology becomes, you know, really affordable. Think about a few hundred dollars every time you go out and want data collected. You can transcribe and then map. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, what elevation do you fly the drones at, and what sort of landscape scale can you? catch 
So right now, in order to, and the FAA is going to hopefully clarify things soon, but you've got to stay under 400 feet okay. um, to stay out of the, the, federal, the federal airspace. Mm -hmm. um, and then really think of this sort of as, as a tool for mapping sort of dozens of acres okay. as opposed to sort of right. hundreds of them, that right. type of um, type of area. Yeah. So to, to pull out the 3D map, how many passes and from how many perspectives do you need to pull out? So that? what we do is it's completely <coughs> automated and it's flying sight lines and okay. it's going just back and forth and it's getting about 75% overlap between the photos. Those? Yep, and then the, uh, and then the processing, like I said, we've got it down for if we, if we fly an area, it takes us about 48 hours to process it to get out both or the rectified images. So this is, this is going to be about um, plus or minus a meter horizontal accuracy. And then for the 3D point clouds, those, those come out as well. And those, they're, they're relative accuracy, not, not absolute, but they're relative vertical accuracy we found for volume estimates, because we've done tits, is actually within 5%, which is really exciting. Some of the stuff you're going to get with like these trees yeah, here is just, you know, you know the, the decisions trees, yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, so what was the, the, the cost for the drone and the associated uh, hardware with it? Yeah, so for so if you want a complete system, you're looking at about $25,000. You can, you can build your own. Um, but your processing times, right? So in our case, we were, we were funded by DOT dollars and the, the mandate or the, our goal for the system was that we will get data out within under 10 hours. And so that's what our system does. It gets data out <coughs> under 10 hours or the rectified imagery, mapping grade, stuff like that. So you can build your own for much, much cheaper. Um, it's just a question of, of uh, where you want to spend your time, right? Processing the data or, or anyone. So does that 25k include the server back in That's the shop? That's true. Well, no, no. Then we have other, you know, what's the high end computers that keep my desk warm and stuff like that. <laughs> you, yeah. So that's just your your fixed wing. That's your system and your, and your software, flight planning and post processing okay. software. Yeah. Yes. How, how much of this do you see will be used for um, flight work? Um, that's 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 our, our primary focus right now is working with VTrans and A&R on looking at sort of flooding and the impacts of floods on roads and streams. So as I said, that's sort of our focus. And I think there's a lot of interest in that, especially when you look at you want to do changes in geomorphology, which we haven't been able to do from a remotely sense data without spending an arm in life. And this is, you just have one unit? Yeah, we just have one unit. We're probably going to get another one in January, so one or two. And so it allows to cover a lot of areas. With the 3D model, could you just clarify, you don't have a LiDAR sensor on this? It's a, it's no, no, so these, these ones here are, um, this is a photogrammetric 3D model, yes, I think, so it's not going to penetrate this tree camp or things like that, so it's not the same as, as LiDAR, but in areas like this, that's why I chose this area, because it looks really good. There's areas where the 3D models really look really bad, but I wouldn't be selling our stuff if I showed that data. Thanks, guys.